right, well, good morning, church. How are we doing? Man, you guys are awake. I'm surprised every time. I don't know. Spring forward, we had a week now, right? Uh, we're still sleeping a little bit in my house. Um, but uh, man, good morning. It's hard to believe we are through spring break, and we are almost to summer. Uh, so we will be there before you know it. We are there. Uh, if we have not met, my name is CJ White, and I'm the director of groups and classes here at Fellowship Bible Church. And as always, it's my blessing uh, to be here with you all this morning. Um, so we are continuing and coming to the end of our series as we've been going through Jesus's most famous sermon, what's known as Sermon on the Mount. And so believe it or not, we have this week and next week, and we will be all done with it. Now, as we wrap up and conclude our time in Matthew, it's been chapters five through seven, uh, it's important to remember where we started. Okay, we have to go back. Shortly after he began his ministry and came on the scene, Jesus called the first disciples to follow him. And at the beginning of chapter 5, we see that he went down and sat down on a mountain, and they came to him. And Jesus began to open his mouth and teach them. And that's where we've been. So over the past almost eight weeks here, this is where we've been. Jesus has been teaching us and revealing to us what a kingdom-centered life looks like. Like This is what he's been revealing to each one of us. And it's been eye-opening, it's been encouraging, it's been challenging. And it's been that time as Jesus has been communicating what matters most. And it hasn't been an outward appearance or a change of our behavior, but rather it's been a motive and a transformation of our heart. That, that is where Jesus is going. He's like, hey, as you follow me, it's not just an outward change. It's what's happening inward. And last week we were all challenged with the words of Jesus is saying, judge not that you be not judged. And listen, that is difficult for each one of us. Even if we would say we don't have a critical spirit within us, we do that. And apart from Christ, apart from our Father in heaven helping us, it's an impossible task to carry that out. And by God's grace, Jesus knew what he was doing, and that's where we come to today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew 7, 7 through 12. We're going to be in Matthew 7, verses 7 through 12. So now, uh, inside our household, we're in a very riveting time, okay? We've, we've got kids spanning, uh, believe it or not, decades, uh, just two, uh, but it's an interesting time in our house, and I always have been describing it lately as going, hey, listen, we're in driving and diapers. Like, that's the stages we're in, and it is still mind-boggling to me. And while each of them are experiencing different stages, uh, the youngest one, who's almost two, is walking through what the older ones already have. Like, there's some similarities, and they all share one thing in common. That's me as their dad. That's me as their father, and they need to ask me for things. Okay? Now, it's interesting, though, to view how different the ask and approach is of each of them. So the little one, Isla June, who's almost two, we're, we're getting there. Like, it's hard to believe. Um, she has this desire, and when she desires something, uh, it doesn't entirely feel so much as an ask as a demand. Right? Like parents of toddlers, or if you've had kids that are older, go back to those days. It's a, I need this. And so now we're like in the stage of teaching etiquette and saying, listen, say please. Like, got to say please. Right? And how nice we need to do that. But um, listen, what's inside that little girl is a desire for something, and she knows who's going to provide it. And so she's coming, and she's coming strong. <laughs> and she knows what to do. Now, my son, Reef, who's 13, a little bit older, uh, the strategy's changed a little bit over time, but I love this boy's tenacity with how he asks. Okay, so he'll come, for example, he'll come and go, hey, Dad, can I have two cookies? Whether it's any time of the day, okay? Can I, can I have two cookies? And I'll go, hey, let, let's do, you can have one cookie. Now, the negotiation skills are not where I think they need to be at this point, because Reef then ups the game and he goes, hey, Dad, can I have three cookies? <laughs> and I'm like... Okay, I don't think you understood what I said. How about none? He goes, one sounds great. I'm like, okay. But, but what's different between Reef and Isla is on most things, he knows what my answer is probably going to be, and he might not ask. Okay, so he knows maybe where I'm going. But that's exactly where our oldest, Naya, is. So Naya's 16, and at this point, she knows how we operate. She knows probably what I'm going to say, if she asks something or not. And so she's very self-sufficient. She goes and does her own thing. Well, the other night, she's in Dallas, she's there for a debate tournament, and she's staying with a friend's family, okay? And I get this call at 8 o'clock at night, because the hotel is right across from Six Flags. And she's got an annual pass, and so I get this call at 8 o'clock at night, and she goes, hey, can, can we go over to Six Flags just for the last hour? 
and it was just her and her friend. And we haven't done that yet. We haven't allowed yet. You guys just go. And I'm like, you know what? If the other parents are cool with it, like, yeah, I had some, you know, reserves. But I'm like, yeah, get after it. Now, her reaction was amazing because she goes, wait, are you serious? <laughs> and I'm like sitting on the phone looking at Reef like, oh, my goodness, I just blew her out of the water. I'm like, yes, you may go. Now, if Naya hadn't asked and just assumed what she thought was going to happen, she would have never received that blessing. She would have never been able to go. Now, unfortunately, as Christians, this is where we can so easily fall when we come to our Father in prayer. You and I can assume an answer from the Lord, and so we don't even go. Or even worse, we become so self-sufficient in our days, we knock things out because we can get things done without ever going to the creator of the universe. We just go and get after it. And this is a danger and a barrier for you and I as we follow Christ. And today, Jesus is once again going to reveal to us that since we have a loving, heavenly Father, we must pursue him in prayer. This is simple, but let me say it again. Like, since we have a loving, heavenly Father, we must pursue him in prayer. So if you'll read with me in Matthew 7, 7 through 12. <clears throat> Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This is God's word. So coming out of this passage today, I have three observations for us in pursuing prayer to our Father. So first is, we are to approach God as our Father. Second, we are to pursue him with humble urgency. And finally, lastly, we are to pursue him expectantly. So first, we are to approach God as our Father. Now, we're going to start a little bit different this morning. We're going to start towards the end of our passage and work our way kind of back up. Because we need to lay a very crucial, vital, foundational piece before we just get into acting, right? Like this is the action we have to take place because when we're discussing coming to the Lord in prayer, the reality that we come to God as a father is vital if we're to come in a manner that Jesus is teaching us. So let's look at verse 11. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Now, this isn't the first time we've heard Jesus say this, right? In the series, in Matthew 6, we heard him say, pray to your Father in heaven. So our first question that we have to ask is, like, listen, even if you've been a Christian for a long time, we have to come back to this. Who is he a father to? Who is he a father to? Well, remember who Jesus is teaching. He's teaching his disciples, specifically those who are following him and have trusted in him with their lives. So for you and I, the Bible teaches that we were born sinful and separated from God as we came into this world, and separated from him for eternity due to our sin, our outright rejection of the creator of the universe. Romans 5, Romans 5 tells us that we were enemies of God. But thanks be to God that he always has been a loving father and desired to bring many into his family. So 1 John 3, 1 tells us, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Now, the question we look at that verse is, what is that love? Well, if we go later on in 1 John 3, it says, by this you know love, that he laid down his life for us. And that's speaking of Jesus. And we know that God sent his son so that you and I could be sons and daughters. And now through trusting in Jesus' perfect life, death, and resurrection, you have the privilege of calling God Father. What a privilege that is. So God is a father to all who have repented of their sins and trusted in his son. And listen, God as a father is not something new or a new idea that Jesus just started communicating during his ministry. God has always been a father. And so as you come to trust in Jesus and now you have a heavenly father, maybe it's hard for you to even think of God as father, right? Some of you in the room maybe think, man, that's king almighty, right? Like he's just and he's powerful. 
but we have a hard time thinking of him as father. How do those two correlate? But listen, all through the scriptures, through the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we see God compared to his father. We see him referred to his father. Like here's just a few examples. In the Old Testament, in Exodus 4.22, we see that he calls Israel, he says, my firstborn son. In Deuteronomy 131, we see, he says, as a father carries a son, I carry you. In Psalm 103.13, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Even the prophet Isaiah, listen to his prayers in Isaiah 63.16 and 64.8. He says, you are our father. You, O Lord, are our father. And then we go into the New Testament. Jesus is always saying, my father, my father. Your father. We saw in Matthew 6, 9 when I talked about the Lord's Prayer. In John 16, 32, he says, I am not alone. The Father is with me. And even the Apostle Paul. So after Jesus has ascended back into heaven when he rose from the grave, his followers continued to refer to God as their father. Paul says in Galatians 4 and in Romans 8, he says, believers are sons crying to God as father. Abba, father. And that Abba word is what they're calling earthly fathers in that day. Like, this is how we're referring. We've been adopted in to the family. So if you and I, through trusting in Jesus, are now children of God, and we see that God is our Father, listen, it is important that we know who he is. Okay? Because if we're to come as we're asked, and we're going to get into what we're to do here in a little bit, we have to know who our dad is, who our father is. Now, this is why we devour the scriptures. This is why we get after the word is to know who our heavenly father is. But specifically from our passage this morning, we're going to see this. And we're going to go over this one point here. Your heavenly father is not your earthly father. Your heavenly father is not your earthly father. So we look back at verse 11. It says, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So listen, the idea of God as Father can be extremely difficult for some of us because of the lack of relationship with our dad, the absence of our father in our lives. Maybe we have never even known our father. We might be here this morning, and your story is that you've never known him, or he's hurt you, your father has hurt you in ways that we could never imagine. And please hear me, that is, that is your story. I am so sorry. It is extremely difficult in those moments when you've had no picture of what a good father is to come to God as father. I get that. I get that. But your heavenly father is not your earthly father. And even for those of us that maybe in this world has been given a good father. So myself, my story is I was adopted as a baby. So I have never known my biological father. But by God's grace, I was given a dad who did love me greatly. um, And that's all by God's grace. But listen, even a father that in the world standards that we say is just crushing it, a loving, compassionate guy, pales in comparison to our Heavenly Father. I hope and desire that I'm a loving, compassionate dad to my kids. But listen, there are times, uh, thanks to remote work, right? Anybody else office out of home? I'm always at the house, and our kids are homeschooled. But yet, listen, There are several moments in a day where my kids cannot come to me and ask for one of their needs. Because if I'm in a video conference call and they don't know I'm even on it, right? I got the AirPods on or my Beats on or something, and they come into the room, Naira Reef coming into the room, they're getting this. Like they're not even getting verbal saying, hey, I can't right now. They're getting the hand up going, you know it's not now because I can't say anything while I'm in this meeting. That is never the case for you and I when we come to our Heavenly Father. He's never putting his hand up to you because he's in a meeting. He is not your earthly father. He's not your earthly father. Jesus says, look at you who are evil. That's us in our sin, right? We are imperfect. If you know how to give good gifts, how much more? With the magnitude will your father, who's the creator of all things, give you good things? So listen, let's look at a couple comparisons, right, of maybe your experience from your earthly father. Did your earthly father ever abandon you? Let's look at Psalm 2710 where it says, For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will let me in. Was your earthly father quick to anger? Well, all through the scriptures, we see that God is slow to anger. He's compassionate and abounding in love. Like this is who he is. 
Your heavenly father will never stop you from approaching him because he has something better to do or because he's sitting there watching the football game forever or he's in a meeting saying, not now, not now, I'll get to you later. He's always attentive, he's always listening, and he's always ready to move at all times, at anywhere, wherever you are. This is who you are approaching. This is your heavenly Father, the God that is love. Not just that he can be loving, but no, 1 John 4 tells us God is love. It is his full embodiment. We know love because he is love. So now we see who we are praying to, so how do we pursue him, right? And remember, as we start to get through these things, we have to remember this first part. Well, second point is we are to pursue him with humble urgency. So we're going back to the top now, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. So here we see three verbs, right? Like I think this is one of the things, if we've been a Christian for a long time, we've seen this. Like we ask, we seek, we knock. Well, these three verbs, ask, seek, and knock, um, they're, all of these are in the present active imperative, right? Which means we're to actively pursue, pursue these always, like continuously. We're supposed to keep doing these. So we're going to look at each individually, though, because I think it gives the full picture of what Jesus is trying to communicate. So first we ask. So the original Greek word here is a teo, okay? And it has this sense of a humble ask. Like, we are approaching in an acknowledgement of our need. Now, listen, it's a humbling situation for you and me when we must ask for something. You know why? Because it's a vulnerability saying we can't provide something for ourselves. Like, we have a need. We have a dependence. But so often, our world screams to us, we need to be what? Independent. Like, right? That's what we're trying to do is we're growing up and we need to leave our homes. We need to be independent. This is what we are. But listen, for you, Christian, this is your entire walk following Jesus is learning dependence. We have to unlearn our independence and relearn complete dependence if we're to come to our Father in heaven. So we are to ask, and this is done in faith. We are asking and approaching our God humbly saying, listen, I need you. I need you to come. I need you to help in this situation. And listen, I am also proclaiming at that same time that he's the only one in the, ult- the one that can ultimately provide, not me and myself. When I'm training a lot of guys in support raising and church planners, so I do a lot of coaching and training for church planners, and they have to raise support, invite people in to support financially. It's a hard thing, especially if someone's been in a career for 20 years and they're getting a paycheck every year to go, now I have to invite and ask in. They, this dependence is created, and then they approach God like they never have before. We're to ask. Next, we seek. We seek. Now, the original Greek word here is ziteo. Uh, and here, it's this picture of an earnest, urgent action. Like we are getting after finding something. So we won't do a show of hands, uh, but have you ever lost your keys when you're in a hurry? Or you're like late for a meeting? I know I'm not the only one, okay? Uh, how fast do you start searching the entire house? Like you're like, Man, I got to find those things, like with fervency, right? This is the picture. Like, do we seek after our father like this? Or have you ever lost a precious stone or a family heirloom? Do you look for a minute, right? Maybe you're not in a hurry now, but do you look for a minute, and then if you never find it, you don't look again? I don't think so. You're thinking all day, man, what could that have been? What did I do last? Man, did we lift up the couch cushions? Did we do this? Like next week, you're continuing to look for it. This should be our posture. This should be our posture when we approach our Father, is seeking Him, seeking Him with fervency. Do we do it urgently? When sickness comes in waves, okay, or we are met with a grave situation, this can drive us to our Lord. Like when we've been in difficult things, we run, right? Like we we know we can't do it, but are we doing it in times where things seem easy? Because that paints a picture of going, man, well, where is my trust? When things are hard and difficult, I know I can't do them on my own, but how am I seeking him when everything would appear easy? But listen, we are always seeking him with this desire, and we're being transforming, and he's dealing with us as we move forward. So lastly, we knock. So the original word here is kruo, uh, and it's to knock persistently or rap with knuckles or to, like, drive a nail into a board. Any carpenters here? This is definitely not me. 
Dwayne, I know Dwayne, and we got you. Um, but you're, how many times do you have to beat that nail down to get it into that wood nice, flat, and flush? You are hammering, 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 hammering. This is how we come, persistent, never stop, keep coming. How many times have you maybe prayed and then gone, yeah, I'm not, I'm not keeping going, I don't hear anything. Have you ever wanted to stop coming to your father in prayer? Have we just neglected it because I'm not even thinking about it? Because I wake up, the phone's right by me, right? Man, that's screaming, notifications going off, all those things, and I just start pounding stuff out throughout my day. Do we ever just stop coming? Pastor Charles Spurgeon uh, had this uh, about the ask, seek, and knock. He said this, and this is just beautiful here. He said, oh, child of God, let nothing keep thee from prayer. It has been well said that a Christian may be hedged in, but he cannot be roofed in. There is always a passageway upwards to the throne of the great father, and asking, seeking, and knocking, he shall be sure to be successful with his suit. Listen, I love that picture. We can have walls all around us. You're never closed in from the top. You can always ask, seek, and knock. And not always can, we always should be. So lastly, we are to pursue him expectantly. That's our final point. We are to pursue him expectantly. So if we look at verse 8, it says, For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. So Jesus tells us that when we ask, we receive. When we seek, we find. And when we knock, the door is opened. The result of our prayers is that our Father in heaven hears us and he gives good things to those who ask. Now, listen, at first glance here, or if we take this out of context, it would appear that we just get whatever we ask, right? I'm surely not the only one that's ever wrestled with that. Like, how do I, like, I don't know how to deal with that. Well, we should expect our Father to give to us and to provide, but listen, it's not the case that whatever we ask, we get. Because listen, he's not in the game of if we're asking for sinful things to just give it. He's a holy God. And we have to remember the context of where we see this passage as well. It came right after him telling us to judge not other people. Because we need his help to do that. We need his help for the whole Sermon on the Mount we just heard, right? So this is what He's communicating. And that first step is to understand the context because if we just pull it, ask and you're going to receive, we're, we're, we're pulling it out of what the Lord intended. So uh, Pastor John Piper pointed this out on this passage as well, which was super helpful for me. He said, if you pay close attention to this passage, it is striking that God promises to give good things to his children. But it's striking because it doesn't say he gives them precisely what they ask for. That is a very key thing for us to understand. Because listen, if God had to answer every single prayer in the way I ask it and what I determine I need, what does that do? That makes me God. That makes me the foreseer of all I need and what I'm doing and not trusting the one who created all things and is holding all things together. So we have to ask, listen, if we're to pursue him expectantly, like we are receiving, what are the good things? What are the good things he gives? Well, in Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13, in this uh, Luke's rendition of this story that, that Jesus is communicating, in verse 13 he says, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The, listen, the Lord has given us himself. Like, he has now placed the Holy Spirit inside us through trusting in Jesus, and the Lord has given us himself. He's given us his son upon a cross, and you will receive good things. Now listen, as we ask for specific things, yes, the Lord will provide as well in his good and right plan. And when we line up with that plan, then okay, we are going to receive, but even if we're not, keep asking, keep coming. We keep going expectantly. Now, however, what do we do when we ask for a specific thing, and it appears we don't receive it, right? We have to ask that question. I know everyone in this room, we've prayed for something, and it seems like we've perceived a no. Like, what do we do with a perceived no? Maybe, maybe you've heard or thought you've heard a no to your prayers, or that specific thing you've been praying for for a long time has not come to fruition. I, I, I know I'm not the only one. 
with that. Like, like, there's no, like, like there's no one on the other end of the line, right? Like you're praying, seeking your dad, and it's like he's not picking up the phone. Have you been there? Has it ever felt like God is stone cold silent? And you're just wrapped in your circumstance or what's happening, and you're like, am I alone? Where is my dad? Where is my father? And it causes you to question, is he a good father? Is he even here? Am I even his? Well, Christian, brother and sister, we have to go back to where we started and remember who our dad is. And this is truth about who our father is, not what my emotions are dictating or what I see, because I'm finite. I, I don't always know what's best. Like, we've been praying. We have a situation where my wife has, has health. A lot of you that know us, chronic health for years. And we keep praying and asking. But sometimes hard things, God brings those in for good for us. But we don't see it and we don't know it. But the truth of the matter is, we have to remember Romans 8, 28, that listen, all things do work together for the good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. That's true. I don't see it always. And it is confusing at times, and I don't understand. But I'm told to keep asking. I'm told to keep knocking. I'm told to keep seeking my Father, because he will give good things. He will, and he does. Now listen, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, the Apostle Paul is wrestling with this thorn in the flesh God gave him. We don't know what that is, um, but he is asking the Lord to remove it. And the Lord speaks to him, and Jesus says, listen, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Now, Paul heard an audible voice of the Lord, and he was told. Now, unless you hear an audible voice of God telling you, no, stop asking, we keep going. We keep going. But we also know in our weakness, his power is made perfect. He's a loving father who gives you good things, even when they don't make sense. Even when they don't make sense. And we have to remember that in Christ, we already have a better circumstance. Even if where you look around and it's like, man, there's no money in the bank. I can't get up out of bed. I can't do these things. In Jesus, he is preparing. This is light and momentary, his scripture says, because he's preparing for you an eternal weight of glory forever with him. So ask him, seek him, and knock after him. Uh, I'm going to share this story to wrap us up here of uh, Pastor George Mueller. If any of you have heard of him, he was a pastor, a missionary in England, and, and he also helped build... Uh, houses for orphans and schools, and he had an amazing ministry that the Lord allowed him to do. And he never, his philosophy was like, I'm never asking a specific person for anything. I'm asking my father, and that's all I'm doing. And the Lord answered in amazing ways. But listen to this story. He, he had this sermon on this specific passage that he gave, and I'm going to read this ex excerpt from it. In November 1844, I began to pray for the conversion of five individuals. I prayed every day without one single intermission, whether sick or in health, on the land or on the sea, and whatever the pressure of my engagements might be. 18 months, 18 months elapsed before the first of the five was converted. I thanked God and prayed for the others. Five years elapsed, and then the second was converted. I thanked God and prayed on for the other three. Day by day, I continued to pray for them, and six Years more passed before the third was converted. I thanked God for the three and went on praying for the other two. These two remain unconverted. The man to whom God in the riches of his grace has given tens of thousands of answers to prayer in the self same day or hour in which they were offered has been praying day by day for nearly 36 years for the conversion of these two individuals, and yet they remain unconverted. For next November, it'll be 36 years since I began to pray for their conversion, but I hope in God, I pray on, and I look yet for the answer. Listen, a few years before his death, four out of the five were converted. After George Mueller passed, a few years later, that fifth came to Christ. We don't know what the Lord is doing, but we're told to ask, seek, and knock. He says, come after me. I give good things. I give good things. I'm your father in heaven. And when you and I come and repent and trust in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we've tasted and known the love of God. We have a loving heavenly father. 
And we must never stop pursuing our Father through prayer. We must never stop. Doubts and all. Frustrations and all. Confusion and all. We must never stop. We keep asking. Keep coming humbly to your Father, revealing your utter dependence on Him. Seek Him. Seek Him as if you lost the most precious diamond in the world in your living room. Seek Him. And what desire would be revealed if we all sought after our Father this way? Man, knock and keep knocking. A persistent pursuit is necessary. Listen, Christian, your Father in heaven sees you. He knows you. He is preparing you. He's transforming you. And he's making you into the image of his Son. This is what he's doing. He gives good things to those who ask. And he's given you the greatest gift you could ever have. He's given you himself for eternity. Let's go to our Father. Will you pray with me? Father, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we do pray for our daily bread, but we know you will sustain us forever. And so I thank you that we can come, we can ask you anything, we can seek you and we will find, we can knock and you will answer. So if it feels, for those in this room, it feels like you are not present would you remind us that you are and that your word is living and active and we can always come to you. I ask that you would refresh our hearts and hear from you again this morning. Help us to be persistent in coming to you and not think that you're ignoring us because you are not putting your hand up to us. You are always there. So Father, we love you. I pray you grow a deeper love in us for you today and we pray all these things in your most precious name. Amen. Amen. Um, well, if you would like uh, to come and seek our Father in prayer right now, I'm going to invite uh, our prayer team up to be able to be here and, and come. And we can ask, seek, and knock. Um, so I hope you all have a wonderful day. Uh, we're going to actually have a new benediction this morning. So uh, St. Patrick's Day, I see a good handful of green out there. I understand I'm not wearing green. Please do not come and uh, get after me with pinching. Um, but uh, listen, if you do not know the story of St. Patrick, Please spend five, ten minutes today. Go on Gospel Coalition. Go on Desiring God. Go somewhere and read about him. There's not a lot we know about him uh, other than his writings and some biographies that are really good. Um, it is amazing what the Lord did through this man um, to, to take the gospel to Ireland. So um, read with this benediction with me, which is known as uh, Patrick's Prayer. Christ, yes, I'll stand and we will, we will get after it. Thank you. All right, read with me. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. Amen. All right. You've all been sent. Have a wonderful day.